Kate is a licensed clinical psychologist who serves as the clinical director at Tuesday's Child. Dr. Kennedy earned her MA and PhD in clinical and school psychology from Hofstra University in New York. Her MA in exceptional child education from UCSF, UCF and her BA in psychology from SUNY at in addition to having a private practice, Dr. Kincaid worked as a school psychologist in Fort Washington, New York, and in Wilmet, Illinois. She's also worked in clinical settings, serving as a cognitive and behavioral psychologist for pediatric and adult patients. She currently provides clinical supervision for postdoctoral residents, is a consultant to the Morin Center in Evanston, and is a psychologist for Woodlands Academy of the Sacred Heart and Lake Forest. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Kincaid. Disorder. If you need me to speak up, just let me know. I hope that we have some type of interaction at moments throughout this presentation, and if you have any questions, please raise your hand. Okay, the objectives of today's discussions um, are to understand the benefits of behavior therapy for these populations, to review the theoretical basis for behavioral strategies, and to highlight consultation guidelines for discussing treatment options <coughs> and recommendations with parents. So while the title of this presentation is broad, it could actually be expanded to include the following categories listed in the DSM-5. We're talking about the categories of neurodevelopmental disorders, disruptive impulsive and conduct disorders, and mood and anxiety disorders with, with children. Within these categories, we're discussing neurodevelopmental disorders, including autism spectrum disorder, ADHD, communication disorders, intellectual disabilities, and specific learning disabilities <coughs> and disorders. <coughs> The category of the disruptive impulse control and conduct disorders include the sub-diagnosis of oppositional defiant disorder, which we'll refer to as ODD throughout the presentation, intermittent explosive disorder, and conduct disorder. And of course, mood and anxiety disorders also have concomitant behavior problems with children. So the co-occurring disorders, the comorbidity of ODD and CD, oppositional defiant disorder and conduct disorder, with ADHD is commonly seen in children reporting for mental health services. Children with CD and ADHD exhibit greater functional impairment than children with conduct disorder only. CD and ADHD in children is more difficult to treat and has a poor long-term prognosis than either disorder in isolation. Depression and anxiety occurs at a higher rate among children and adolescents with ODD and conduct disorders and with ADHD and conduct disorders in general than in the larger population of non-diagnosed children. Children with anxiety problems combined with ADHD um, or the ADHD oppositional defiant disorder presentation have more significant problems and are harder to intervene with than children <coughs> presenting with any of these disorders separately. So while each of these disorders has very distinguished defining features, children with any of these disorders have significant behavior impairment that impairs their functioning, family life, and necessi necessitate behavior intervention for both the targeted child and the family. Up as a side note, recently talked about increased attention has begun to center on early identification and prevention of challenging behaviors and how to develop strategies for decreasing such behaviors. There's recent research on the critical role that social and emotional well-being plays for school readiness and that the negative trajectories of early problem behavior has led to a national focus on the prevention and intervention services for children and their families. And in addition, as we all know, now there seems to be a national 
interest in talking about the use of discipline, the use of physical punishment of children, as um, recent conversations have turned to the case of Adrian Peterson in the NFL um, being reprimanded when he didn't switch on his child. So this has really brought to the forefront a national discourse on how do we effectively discipline children. And in particular, what can we do with children who have behavior disorders? So as far as prevalence, risk, and force, prevalence estimates vary greatly. Campbell estimated that 10 to 15 percent of children have mild to moderate behavior problems. Levine found that in a pediatric population, almost 20 percent of pre-K uh, children met criteria for a diagnosable disorder, with 9% of them being classified as severe. However, more recently, West and colleagues reported that approximately 10% of kindergartners arrive at school with problematic behavior. And you can imagine having problematic behavior, setting them up for academic failure and difficulties in peer relations. So again, very critical that early intervention is done. What are some of the common risk factors? <clears throat> there are a number of risk factors leading to a higher likelihood of behavior challenges, including parenting style, which we will later return to. Children in poverty also appear to be especially vulnerable, with rates of behavior problems higher than in the general population. As far as the course or trajectory of behavior disorders, <coughs> Well, naturally, some children outgrow behavior problems before entering school. Other problems continue and intensify, leading to school failure and social maladjustment. So as we know, many children exhibit fussiness, withdrawal, overactivity, anxiety, tantrums, and aggression. But for the majority of the children, these behaviors are transitory and situation-specific. It is the persistence, intensity, and pervasiveness that determine the need for intervention. Um, so what are some of the common behavior challenges across disorders? Non-compliance, tantrums, aggression, and difficulties in self-regulations. On an extreme level, Moffat and colleagues reported that about 6% of all boys appear to follow an early start or life course persistent developmental pathway for conduct problems characterized by violence and serious antisocial behavior in adolescence. And while each of these disorders may have unique trajectories, there are these common behaviors evidenced across these disorders. So we see there can be extreme, almost persistent behavior disorders that lead to um, extreme violence, <coughs> substance abuse, and adolescence. For the majority of kids, that early intervention can change that trajectory. Early intervention is critical. Children at the greatest risk for engaging in substance abuse or delinquent behavior in adolescence exhibit oppositional defiance <coughs> disorder and conduct disorder at a young age. The risk of later problems is increased if the child associates with deviant peers, the child's parents engage in harsh and inconsistent discipline, if the child's parents have difficulty monitoring the child's activities, or if the child has academic failure and poor relationships at school. These uh, researchers who highlighted this um, noted that the risks are multiplied if any of these factors are present. So the other child, family, and contextual risk factors in turn contribute to the development of early onset conduct problems in a cumulative and synergistic manner. Children whose temperament is more impulsive, <coughs> hyperactive, and quick to anger often overwhelm parents. Many parents inadvertently respond to these children with harsh and punitive measures, and their discipline is ineffective, whereas others respond by frequently giving in to the child's demands in the hopes of appeasing the situation, but either style is ineffective. <coughs> Both harsh and inconsistent discipline 
actually increase the likelihood of further cognitive problems. Ineffective parenting results in children developing increased behavior problems, and children who are in turn are increasingly difficult to parent. The cycle leads to impairment in the child and family's functioning. Harsh parenting leads to a negative model of behavior. Let me go back in just a moment. So harsh parenting provides a negative model of behavior, fails to promote pro-social child behavior, and impedes the development of adaptive social cognitive skills. An inconsistent parenting or the inability to set limits results in early conduct problems actually becoming stable habits or persistent patterns of behavior. So both of these styles of parenting, sometimes in reaction to children with very difficult temperaments or sometimes feeding into that, um, result in ineffective parenting and an increase in problems. So these cascading, cascading domains of risk factors lead to high levels of family stress and may contribute to poor support for the child's academic and de social development. <clears throat> so um, going on, thinking about the problems that are created by this parent stress and negative parenting. Parents of preschool children displaying ADHD and ODD symptoms report higher levels of stress and more frequent use of negative parenting strategies than do other parents. Frequently this is referred to as coercive parenting style, authoritarian parenting style. Negative parenting practices may contribute to co-occurring disorders of ADHD and ODD and may also lead to more severe impairment in school, social, and home arenas in children with ADHD and may play a direct role in the development of oppositional defiant disorder. You can just imagine coercive parenting style, threatening, leading to a child who may also, by temperament, be willful, leading to this cascade of problems and ongoing conflict. So Webster and Stratton use that phrase, the cascading, cascading domains of risk factors, make it imperative to start prevention programs as early as possible in order to nip problems in the bud before they create secondary school and peer risk factors and in order to provide adequate fertilization for building protective factors that guard against substance abuse and violent behavior. <coughs> so we're trying to provide early intervention to interrupt that trajectory of leading into adolescent substance abuse, violent behavior, and ongoing adjustment difficulties. So the let me go back because I wanted to say a little bit more about the importance of early intervention. Um, Aaron concluded that without intervention, aggressive tendencies tend to crystallize around age eight. There's some evidence to suggest that if children with aggressive behavior problems are not treated by age eight, their learning and behavior problems become less responsive to intervention and are more likely to become a chronic disorder. <coughs> Alternatively, there's evidence that the earlier the intervention is offered, the more positive the child's behavioral adjustment at home and at school, and the greater chance of preventing later delinquency and drug abuse. <coughs> I'm going backwards here. <laughs> so what are some of the challenges that we're trying to address when we do early intervention we're trying to address those key factors for helping children to adjust at school. So the key developmental issues for high-risk children at school entry are the control of aggressive behavior, the acquisition and use of pro-social skills with peers, positive relationships with peers, parents, and teachers, and the development of a positive interest in school. I have a question. Yeah. <coughs> um, do the studies address um, who should do the early intervention or uh, such as um, an outside um, psychologist versus um, does, if early intervention 
I know I'm in neurology, or peds neurology, and the resources are so limited for Medicaid patients that we often have the school work with the school social worker just to get some early intervention. Absolutely. So we're going to be talking about that. Multiple pathways to help, how children are referred, and then where can they go? Where can families turn to help? And then particularly with um, disadvantaged, economically disadvantaged family, the schools are a resource that we have to work with. Um, but not only for economically disadvantaged, they have to be part of that circle of support for children. So we'll be talking about the role of clinicians, um, mental health agencies, <coughs> and schools, and then provided intervention and support. But early intervention, going through the school district, is, is one of those avenues. But speaking of, uh, of relevance today, pediatric providers are likely to be the first health professionals with whom parents will discuss the concerns regarding their preschool age children's behaviors, and they're capable of playing a key role in deciding whether or not to take early action. So there are multiple pathways to help. Um, these include child find, child find screenings through school districts, referral from private providers such as OT and speech therapists, and from parents reporting directly to psychologists and pediatricians. Many times, children with significant behavior problems are precluded, though, from benefiting from occupational therapy, speech. Oftentimes, a pediatrician may <coughs> notice very early on that there is some concomitant speech or motor problems, so they'll refer to a provider for that. Perhaps trying to circumvent the behavior problems, thinking perhaps the behavior problems are related to that. And so the child may be directed to speech therapy, which is a good path to follow. However, oftentimes, the behavior is such that it will interfere with the child's being able to participate in that form of therapy due to non-compliance, due to attention problems, due to very disruptive behavior. So sometimes the parents will come back and say, well, they couldn't participate in that. What can we do now? <coughs> Interesting, thinking about the patterns of referral, Pediatricians, this is a relatively dated study, but still has a good point to make. Pediatricians were actually less likely to indicate that preschool age children had emotional or behavioral problems compared to psychologists who conducted psychological assessments of children. <clears throat> Greater than 50% of preschool children who had emotional problems based on a psychologist evaluation actually did not receive counseling, medication, or mental health referral from their pediatrician. <coughs> So the preschool parent pediatrician consultations, what are the predictive referral patterns for problematic behaviors? Fanton, McDonald, and Harvey did a longitudinal study where parents were asked whether they consulted with their pediatric providers about their disruptive behavior problems that they were seeing in their children. They asked, what is the frequency with which parents of four-year-old children with behavior problems actually reported consulting with their pediatrician about their child's behavior. They also ask when parents do consult, what do they report regarding the advice that they receive from their pediatrician? And then three, are consultations and referrals more likely among those children who continue to show behavior <coughs> problems? The participants in their study were 170 children in their family and they participated in a four-year longitudinal research program um, concerning ADHD and ODD among young children. Interestingly, um, of the 74 parents, children whose parents had consulted with their pediatrician by age four, 78% were later diagnosed at age six with ADHD <coughs> and ODD. So it's telling you right away, if a parent is trying to consult about behavior, it's very likely that in a year or two, they will have actually met full-blown criteria for ADHD or oppositional defiant disorder. I think sometimes there's concern about, well, this may be a phased developmental issue, but the key term is that the parents are asking about behavior. It is highly likely that they indeed are talking about a persistent problem. Of the 80 children whose parents had not consulted with a pediatrician by age four, only 41% had later met the criteria for ADHD and ODD in this high-risk population. 
So those who were referred, 24 of the 27 who were referred, received diagnosis. So there's a very positive predictive power of the behavior consultation. So they concluded that pediatricians <coughs> are, were able to distinguish between transient versus persistent behavior problems in preschoolers. Providers did not over-refer at age four. And that parental reports of early behavioral concerns signal persistent behavior problems. Parents were able to discriminate between problems that were likely to persist versus those who were, that are transient. So there, in this study, there was no evidence for over-referral. Very few, few children with transient behavior problems were referred as preschoolers. So taking a look then, why is there still a bit of under-referral? <coughs> um, so only 22% of children whose parents consulted with their pediatricians later outgrew their problems versus 59% of children whose parents did not consult and whose behavior eventually improved. So let's talk for a moment about what might be some of the reasons for under-referral. It could be that parents uh, feel that there's a stigma attached to the behavior problems. Parents may feel that they're going to be negatively evaluated or criticized and blamed for their child's having a behavior problem. It could be the nature of the visit itself. The child may only be with their pediatrician for a few minutes and in the office setting. There may not be any demonstrable behavior problems of note. So there could be a multitude of reasons. Could also be that pediatric and healthcare providers are unaware of where to refer for help. Even if the behavior problem is obvious <coughs> within the clinic setting, there may be um, a lack of knowledge of where are services. Could also be part of uh, a doctor's training. Are they aware of behavior disorders in childhood? Is that their specialty? Would they know where to refer, what to look for? Parents' descriptions are key. Parents may be downplaying what the problems that they're having. And then people may not know what key terms to listen for in, during the consultation. And frankly, there may be inadequate screening or follow-up from screening. Oftentimes, there is a behavior screening done, but sometimes it's kept in the file and may be referred to later. So there could be multiple reasons for under-referral. So the importance of consultation. So um, again, children and parents who consulted with their pediatricians were much more likely to ultimately receive medication or psychosocial treatment compared to children of parents who did not consult with their pediatricians. So thinking about what some of those key terms during consultation may be, and I'd like to share from a, moment, from a parent's perspective, what are some of the things that they said to their pediatrician? We ask many parents that Tuesday's Child which is a behavior intervention program for children and an education program for parents, we asked, just to get some anecdotal records, what did parents say to their pediatricians and what were some of the things that the pediatricians did in helping them access services? Um, one parent actually said, well, I didn't even have the right terminology to speak to my pediatrician. I wasn't sure what to say. One parent said um, that the doctor noticed that the, the child was very helpful and then checked in with the parent. Are you okay with this behavior? The child's bouncing off the wall. And then they wanted to know, how is the parent handling things? <clears throat> Others reported some unhelpful responses, such as the child's just sick, going through a phase. This is just developmental. But then the parent said, but by three, same problems. And by four, okay, it's definitely a problem. So there may have been a lag in the referral. And then um, some parents have said that their pediatricians flat out told them, if you do not get some help for your child's behavior problems, 
you are putting your child at a serious disadvantage when they start school. So what are some of the language, uh, what are some of the verbiage that parents might say that would be a heads up, a warning sign that the parents and the family need help? Parents reported saying things like, well, I'm afraid I can't take their places. I feel like I'm walking on eggshells around my child. My child is uncontrollable. I'm not safe with my child. My child's hurting himself and others. So those were some key terms that parents might say during their consultation. What about parental behaviors to look out for? Parent crying, telling you they're feeling overwhelmed, would obviously be indicators that they need referrals for behavior intervention. So let's take a moment. We were talking about multiple pathways to help. And looking at this case study, this was a case study of a, a parent whose child was later diagnosed with apraxia and oppositional defiant disorder. Her pediatricians were helpful along the way, but it took multiple visits and a whole constellation of, her, of events for her to eventually get help for her daughter. So we'll just listen for a few minutes and see. Learn from the parent to see what she has to say. Let me know if you can hear this. Um, one of the big reasons why we took you look at the camera or yeah. it, it, look at the camera and then okay. and you can see yes, um, it's here. One of the big reasons why we did come to Tuesday's child, it all started back when it was about I say about 15, 16 months, we started noticing that at the playground with friends, with kids around us, where you could do everything every other kid could do besides talk, sit still, hold still, listen. Um, when we would go places to parties, um, gatherings with friends, park. There would be, you know, Bridget kind of off doing her own thing. We would say no, we would say stop, we would, you know, try and get her to comply, and there was this non compliance. Um, and we noticed that a lot of it had to do with the speech. She wasn't talking. So everybody started telling us whether it was parents, you know, friends, moms, groups, Google. This comes with age, you know, she's still so young, she is so little, it is an age appropriate. Um, and then you delve into the whole bad discipline of, you know, time out, don't time out, take away, don't take away, ignore, don't ignore. Everything you read and everything people tell you, it contradicts one another, so it's hard to get that behavioral help. <clears throat> When we decided to go through the speech therapy process, our pediatrician at Bridget's 18 month appointment did notice that we didn't have the required 50 to 150 words to be normal if she wasn't in the normal range. Um, going through that and with the speech, when we were diagnosed, we did Google apraxia and she fit according to us every single thing that we found on there. You know, um, there was very little babbling and cooing at, you know, um, infancy. She could only say two words. Everything else was just a lot of monotone screaming and yelling. Um, and it did say there's bad behavior in that. You know, kids who can't speak often get frustrated. So then we're assuming that this is all just piled into this neat little box with a bow on it, and this is what we've been given. But then the therapist said, no, it's not apraxia. She just isn't one to talk, doesn't need to talk yet, you know, um, go home, read books, don't let her watch TV, and she's just going to start talking. So 10 months went by, and things were getting progressively worse. In fact, it was getting worse to the point where the first speech therapist that Bridget went and saw and was seeing for continuing therapy would actually say, you know, these therapy sessions are so hard because she can't sit still. And then I would ask her, well, how do we get her to sit still? And she would say, I don't know. And as my pediatrician, she would then, you know, say when we would ask our pediatrician about things, you know, that we could be doing, you know, her big thing was, um, you know, about it being age appropriate and also, you know, it is the speech 
regular basis, then to almost say can get help from your pediatrician sometimes is difficult because they only are supposed to be seeing your child after six months, I think every three months, for 10 to 15 minutes. And it's so rushed anyways, they're worried about the medical, I'm worried about the developmental, and we have to kind of bring this to a head. Um, our pediatrician was very supportive in getting Bridget um, speech therapy, and in fact, six months through, I actually had a very lengthy conversation with her on the phone, and she called me, I sent her an email, because I was concerned that we didn't have more words of speech, and she did tell us that we should go for a reevaluation, and then we, we hemmed and we hawed about it, you know, should we, shouldn't we, Bridget likes to go, this place is close to our home, it is convenient, they accept our insurance, there's so many variables going on. Let me just fast forward a little bit. Um, on ear doctor, because Bridget never got a traditional hearing screening, which is crucial. Now that I know this for speech therapy, I didn't know this then. I didn't know she needed a hearing screening. I could say her name and she would turn around and look at me. Um, we finally got our traditional hearing test through Lurie Children's, and the ear doctor looked at me and my husband. He said, if She can hear fine. I think she has apraxia. And it was that light at the end of the tunnel when that doctor looked at my husband and said this because it was the validation of what we thought from the beginning. All of our. So this parent uh, did eventually get referred for behavior intervention oh, as well. The speech therapist handed the stuff from Tuesday's child. She said, This is what we need to do, and I guarantee Bridget will be okay. I didn't care what it was called anymore. I didn't care if it was behavior therapy, I didn't care what it was. I wanted my kid to be like everybody else. And when I told the pediatrician a few weeks later at our um, two and a half year checkup that we were at Tuesday's Child, she's like, I was going to tell you about Tuesday's Child. I was going to do this, but I hadn't seen you. I hadn't heard from you. You know, I'm a pediatrician who only seen three to six months. You know, and that's a long time to wait. Even when we went through DI in the beginning to get Bridget's evaluation done for speech, the first few places that I called told me four months. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking to myself, I have to wait four more months to know if my child is going to talk. That's, I mean, that's a really significant time when developmentally you read on Google, you have one to three. And so, <laughs> you're a very verbal parent, very involved parent, um, who has participated in uh, Tuesday Child Parent Education <coughs> Program while her daughter is in the classroom receiving behavior support and then she has stayed on to become a trainer mm -hmm. so it's a model that that works for parents continuing on the program and then just a couple more words um, from her uh -huh. so they not listen to you down the line is there anything you're concerned about and a lot of people did say that you know pediatricians did say things like well boys are just you know they're just wild as mom with special needs, I'm exhausted. If I would have known, Bridget just turned three last week, if I would have known a year and a half ago, I could have come to a place like Tuesday's Child, or I could have gotten the help that I needed more than her. I needed this more than she did. I needed to know how to help her. It's not that she went into this room and they kind of helped her, you know, listen better. It was me. This is what I needed. This is what my husband needed. This is what our family needed to know that Bridget's special needs go beyond just not being able to speak. And then what changes have occurred since you were participating in the behavior management teaching program here? Um, we can go to Target. <laughs> we can go to the zoo. We can go to parties. Um, we can take Bridget in public settings, and I know she's going to listen to me, and she's not going to be frustrated because we do have that opening. Um, Tuesday's Child has also helped Bridget to understand that this isn't Bridget against the world. This isn't, you know, Bridget against mom and dad, and nobody understands her because I didn't know how to understand my child with special needs. Um, you know, and, and I think that's a big thing too, is it's not only the child with special needs, it's the parent who has the child with special needs. I think there's so much more of an outcry for the parents. And in going to Tuesday Child, they give you the tools and the confidence. Talking to other parents who have been there, who understand, when I go and I cry at night in the bathroom because I have a child that can't talk, um, I don't know why she's hitting me. I don't know. I, I don't know what to do. I, I've tried everything. Um, it's good to have that where somebody can say, "I know how you feel," because.
because until you're a parent with a special needs child, you don't have an opinion on how somebody else can feel. And it's a very powerful thing. And, you know, we, we've changed so when our mom got a lot of things, and we've also let go of a lot. You know, even if Bridget does have a meltdown at Target or a meltdown at the zoo or a meltdown at a friend's house, I have the tools now not only to let go of that, but then to pick her back up and go on. You know, we're not avoiding normal social situations. Um, we're not avoiding, you know, having Bridget be Bridget and who she is and, and letting her see the world like every other kid because she might not be able to handle it. You know, we now have the tools to antecedent play on the entire day. Um, we have tools to, you know, let her understand we're going to the zoo. So I'm going to stop it there. But I just think she gave a powerful testimony about the importance of behavior intervention. Anyone have any questions? Okay, what was so she diagnosed with? Uh, her daughter was diagnosed with um, verbal apraxia mm -hmm. and oppositional defiant disorder. And treatment just was at behavioral? Well, she first tried to get the speech right. therapy, and they were having such difficulty because of her behavior interfering with her ability to derive any therapeutic benefit from that. And then eventually, more consultations led her to the suggestion for behavior intervention and evaluation at Lurie's, and Lurie's contact, at, let the mom contact Tuesday's child. And there are other behavior intervention programs available. She selected Tuesday's child. And so she had the behavior intervention support, and then her child is still participating in speech therapy as well. Yeah. Does screening have help when the child is too young? Too young? No. When the child is young, she talked about 18 months. Yes. I would <clears throat> hope that, I mean, they would have screened the child, social, emotionally, developmentally, something. I don't know if I hear none of that. Yes, no, she hadn't been. Um, and it would have. Again, you know, some of that, the problems of early screening not occurring, or the recommendations from early screening not being followed through. And so sometimes it takes multiple visits, multiple consultation for a parent to hear what the pediatrician or healthcare provider is recommending, and for there to be a real um, tipping point for a parent to get the help that's being recommended. And then sometimes, what about the ASUSE? Pardon? ASUSE is the screening tool? Yes. Mm -hmm. So, again, that should be able to pick up many of the behaviors that um, are of concern. But is that our recommendations being um, told to parents about those screenings? You know, that, that's the key. Is, is there a, a missing link there? Is everyone truly saying the results of these indi uh, screenings indicate that you need to have behavior intervention help? So, you know, the follow through, through may not be so helpful. Um, okay, so going back and moving on here, let's see. Um, so, can I, can I ask you a question? Sure. So, for a child, you know, we use the M chat sometimes or ages and stages. Yes. Would you consider those to be appropriate screening tools for ages 15 years and months in terms of a primary practice? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sure. So is there anything else you recommend or that's what? Ages and stages is good. Um, for If you're seeing that this is a child whose behavior is really involved and you can tell right away from those key terms that the parents have told you or from behavior that you're directly observing, I would recommend there's a the instrument called the BASC. Behavior Assessment Scale for Children. It goes into more depth. It will provide more diagnostic information. It will help tease out ADHD, oppositional defiant. It helps tease it out so you have even more quantifiable data. It's norm referenced also. So the ages and stages, those are good, you know, screening measures. There's something more in depth that if you're really suspecting the behavior problem, you could go right into using the BASC. Is that on the public domain? Um, Purchase. Yeah. But it's not that costly. You're referring to the SP, not the ASP. Um, yes. SP. So, I'm not sure what you mean. The SP. Social emotional. Yes. Not the ASP. Right. The social emotional, I mean, you're probably getting both. 
Yes. Speaking from the point of view, I'm a child fitness consultant, so I'm not a pediatrician, and I work a lot with the children, and I'm in this area of screening, and we do a lot with okay? They, it's always advisable to do the developmental and the social emotional because when you look at the trainings and the research that we have looked at for the last 20 years, most of the social emotional have a background problem with the developmental, and that's how the trainers to at least train our providers to do the screenings. So we're hoping that you know maybe the students mm -hmm. can tell us: Do you guys do you like the Dow Ford? Do you like peas? Do you like vegans? Like you know what tools? Are the pediatricians using yes. because like in King County our goal is to pull out the pediatricians numbers and we really don't know who is screening so we're telling our parents take this to them. Yeah, I mean those are all good measures for developmental screenings. The, the Bugans is a little bit um, cumbersome to score I think. Yeah. Um, so that would be a little bit difficult. They're all good measures and you any sample of behavior is helpful. And especially if they are norm-referenced, any sample of behavior that's norm-referenced is helpful. But the dial and, and the bagans may miss some of those key behavioral and social-emotional issues. But they could pick up on speech, motor, other developmental delays that could be uh, related to behavioral and social-emotional Is that a problem with the payment still, like the pediatrician's office? Screens, do they get paid, or what is the rationale that we can get the screens? Like in my area, I can speak to all of them. Um, I would think that they could be. Um, yeah, that's a, you do get reimbursed for your developmental screen. The ASPSC does not get paid for it. Yeah. For it. Mm -hmm. As long as it's a validated tool. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, questions? Um, so, thinking about your own screenings and then when to involve others, um, going more in depth and defining out what's wrong. So the AAP guidelines say when to involve specialists when the child is younger than five years old and problems don't respond to the primary care intervention. The family is not able to maintain a safe environment, the child's behaviors are injurious. The child is experiencing depression, anxiety, or serious, severe dysfunction in any domain. And problems at school are interfering with academic functioning or relationships. Advocacy studies and practice guidelines. Um, there's a lot of evidence that behavior intervention um, is effective in the long run for children with behavior disorders, particularly for autism spectrum disorder for ADHD, and for oppositional defiant disorder. One of the key components is that it's finding the right type of behavior intervention. Guidance from the um, AAP, based on recommendations from the World Health Organization, is using evidence-based and evidence-informed interventions for disruptive behavior and aggression. The psychological interventions that provide the best support include parent management training. <clears throat> For autism spectrum disorders, that early intensive behavioral intervention is the only well-established treatment <clears throat> for young children with ASD. Parent training in ADHD, a meta-analytic study examining the effects of parent training on child and parental outcomes found that parenting competence was the only outcome that had a large effect, which decreased to a moderate effect, effect size at a long-term follow-up. But still, to think of all the variables that were examined, to think that it was that sense of parent competence that held true over time as having a real effect on um, ADHD was quite impressive. And isn't it something that it's that parents felt competence, that they feel confident and competent that they have behavior tools to help their child that really seems to make a difference. Because some pathology won't change, but the behavioral expression of that pathology can be greatly affected by parents having competent tools and a sense of confidence that they can handle behavior problems. So the conclusion from that police study was that parent training and behavioral management is an effective intervention for children with ADHD and of course for treatment resistant 
you know, that medication goes hand in hand with that. So AAP guidelines for children with disruptive behavior disorder or aggression. AAP reports said that all children manifesting disruptive or aggressive behaviors require intervention. They urge that you engage child and, and the family in care together. And they also, in their report, noted that without engagement, most families will not seek or persist in care. And that the process may require multiple primary care visits. Another study in the AHRQ review said that effective parent programs help parents develop positive relationships with their child, teach them about how children develop, and help them manage behavior with positive discipline. So let's take a look at some of what is behavior intervention, what are we talking about, and what are some of the components. This is um, the director of parent education at Tuesday Child who will give a description of um, what occurs in the program. Problem solving and difficulties. 
Another format for behavior intervention <coughs> is through group-based parent programs that are facilitated by one or two facilitators. Other behavior intervention programs simply provide videotapes of, or vignettes of appropriate and inappropriate parenting techniques. So there are multiple models and another approach is self-administered training through books, CDs, internet materials, and it can be a reasonable approach offered if you have clinical consultation that goes along with it. However, the group-based model offers that additional opportunity for parents to provide the social support that helps parents feel less lonely and stigmatized and more empowered. So some of the components of parent-child training at Tuesday's Child, another brief video clip, Parents are noticing that behavior. We, our parents come and they're spending a 
a lot of time trying, uh, noticing bad behavior. Stop hitting your sister. Leave your, leave the dog alone. Don't jump on the couch. Stop, uh, stop running. So they're noticing a lot of the inappropriate behavior, spending a lot of time on that. So when the kids are calm, um, being appropriate, they kind of walk through the room and they think, I don't have a job here. And we focus uh, our attention on there's a huge job to do here. So one of the techniques is teaching parents about how to use their attention as a behavior management tool. What are some of the other behavior intervention techniques that you develop with parents? Um, the, an, uh, another technique or, uh, that we talk about is uh, antecedent planning. Uh, especially with uh, too late or you know early childhood kids, three to five, six years old, often as parents we've we've forgotten about the concept of a diaper bag. When you have an infant or a, a, a toddler, you wouldn't leave the house without a diaper bag, an extra pair of clothes, a, a diaper, some juice, some cookies, and things like that. So that setting yourself and your child up for success when you're out. Then our child is potty trained and doesn't need to, you know, to eat every couple of hours and we forget to bring something like that. But we talk about antecedent planning as your kids get older. How can we set our kids up for success when we go to a restaurant with a four-year-old? They don't, they don't go to the restaurant for the same reasons we do. So Joanne goes on to talk about another, um, some other strategies. But one of the key things involves that relationship that the parent develops with the trainer. And I thought this was such an interesting quote that um, was given by Webster, Stratton, and Taylor when they looked at um, the behavior intervention programs and compared the efficacy of different approaches. And they said, people unfamiliar with the parent training literature often mistakenly assume that parent training simply involves didactically sharing information or teaching about valid behavior management strategies. They assume that this is relatively simple and that it makes little difference how clinically skilled the instructor is. Um, and that a relationship focus is secondary to teaching parents particular skills. But these researchers note that although this might be true for universal interventions for low risk populations, the research does not support this view for higher risk families experiencing multiple stressors or for those whose child is already exhibiting high levels of behavior problems. For these families, a more clinically sophisticated therapeutic approach is needed when conducting parent training. It is critical that the process of parent training is a collaborative one based on a supportive and caring relationship between the therapist and family. The therapist must demonstrate genuine understanding of what it is like to be a parent of a child with behavior problems. So I think that, that makes it kind of unique that having parents sitting with parents Knowing what they've been through together um, is powerful. So let's just finish in a few moments. We'll watch the rest of this and then wrap up with a couple more slides and give you a chance to ask questions if you have. Generally, parents come here um, because, for one reason or another, their child isn't listening. It might be they're not listening at school, they're not listening at home, following simple directions, simple routines at home, like getting up getting dressed and getting out of the house in the morning, or maybe they're having difficulty at school following teacher direction or socializing appropriately. Maybe they're impulsively um, aggressive or purposely aggressive. Uh, so those are, those are the main reasons why parents come to choose this show. And how does the relationship between the trainer and the parent develop? What do their interactions look like on a typical week? So the, the peer mentoring program at Tuesday's Child is, is um, really, I think, a, um, a highlight of our program. Um, parents go through their 12 weeks of training, then they stay on and go through a, just a very brief Tuesday's Child training program, and then they train with a peer mentor, and then they become trainers on their own. Um, and so the, the trainer um, trainee or mentor mentoring relationship is, is really a powerful teaching tool here at Tuesday's Child. Uh, I would love to say that the techniques that we 
by somebody who was in their shoes just a few weeks ago, a few months ago, is really uh, powerful, impactful for our parents. I think Joanne really speaks to if many of the parents come feeling beat up and ashamed, responsible for their child's difficulties. And so there's a great deal of hope that is imparted in that group format and parent-to-parent -parent, uh, understanding. So some of the skills that parents learn, they learn to become a good observer of their child's behavior, to not take their behavior personally, to become a little bit detached and able to buffer their responses. They learn to collect data on antecedents' behavior and its consequences. They learn the importance of structure, routine, fair expectations, and predictable consequences. They learn how to use visuals, schedules, social stories. How many of you have heard of the use of social stories before? There is a woman named uh, Maria Garcia Wiener who has developed these social stories um, to teach children about their behavior, and they're really wonderful tools to use. To learn the power of attention and to use attention as a behavior management tool, and then children, or parents also learn to enhance their children's self-regulation skills by validating their feelings and encouraging good choices. So that wraps up today's program on behavior intervention, the need for early intervention, and some um, consultation suggestions for pediatricians. Do you have any questions? Yes. Hi. Hi. Um, as a pediatrician, um, I was very much interested in behavior and development. You get a lot of parents um, discussions about this you know, the behavioral problems I have. My problem is that most of the patients that I have, their families are under public aid insurance and resources for them is very hard to come, to come up with. Right. Mm -hmm. Tuesday's charge, uh, I mean, we don't have it in the county. I don't have any, mm -hmm. any um, available um, resource, any local resource to send my parents to, um, to do it. What are your suggestions? How we can... You know, so, how accessing you help. Yes, accessing help through um, multiple channels. I mean, there's, there are the Parent-Child Interaction Institute. Um, I think that's offered through UIC. Um, so a number of universities do have clinics and they will serve uh, families who um, are low income. They have DePaul. Distant. Distant. So, but accessing help in any way possible to get them through that door. So there are parent education materials speaking to them about behavior management, um, books, resources, any way you can. Also, helping them access services through their school district. The school districts are required to provide behavior support. You're going to mention that everyone has access to their district's support. So encouraging the families to get a evaluation through their school, calling their early intervention services, they can access occupational therapy, speech therapy, behavior intervention is part of that support that they're eligible for. So I know, I wish that there were more, but many of the programs that are out there will see um, families on a sliding scale as well. Yes. Uh what, what, so what are the ages that, that the school has to do an evaluation? And is that just kind of a, a quick and easy way to do it? If you, like, if you, you know that, that the school can do it and you don't really know about resources for a Medicaid family, right. can you just, I mean, how, how easy is it and what ages can they well, do Well, it's that? not necessarily easy because they do have a 60-day window from the time right. of the request Right. to the, for the evaluation to complete, and that's 60 school days. Right. So it's not like you can get immediate help, and it is a process of getting help, but it is a valuable resource. And, um, you know, to be able to collaborate with the schools, the districts, how early you can get help, I mean, from birth on, you okay. know, through, and then they age into the school age um, special education help. Um, but, yes. So what, and, and it, let's say it, it, the child doesn't, doesn't exactly um, qualify for an IEP but may need some help. Is the school going to find that help um, for the kid? Or? So, you know, with um, children can also have 504 accommodation plans that include some accommodations for behavior. Um, but students with severe behavior problems are often, they have the comorbid disorders, which can be 
fit under the rubric of emotional disturbance mm -hmm. or other health impaired. Those are two ways of getting IEPs. If they have anxiety disorder, ADHD, emotional disturbance, those are different ways of getting a child an IEP with behavior support. So it can be a little bit difficult, but schools are mandated to provide help. And it, the help may look like um, a teacher consultant, the help may be a paraprofessional in the classroom or one to one with the child, to be social work counseling for the child and family. And of course, in the case of autism spectrum disorders, there's a whole um, other array of help that can be provided in the home as well. So, yes. The, the challenge with the school issues is that the, the problems have to be affecting the child in the school. So it can't just be that it's at home. Um, it has to be disruptive at school or it's, they will not do testing. But that wouldn't be like age two. Right. So think about the you know early intervention services. Right. For, for yes, school, they actually after age of three when, when you're done with the early intervention. Mm -hmm. Zero to three and then after age of three then the school district has to do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just do want to say that Illinois is um, finally expanding uh, Medicaid options for mental health. Um, and um, parent training can be done um, by independent psychologists. So if there are mental health agencies within your county um, that do take Medicaid or are on sliding scale, parents could go and see an independent um, individual psychologist to receive similar training um, for behavioral um, intervention parenting techniques. So I would just say that that might be an option. So I would call some of your local mental health clinics. Uh, yeah. Correct, yeah. So I know that there are several in Chicago, but they are expanding. Um, and um, they've also expanded the option to actually um, people to share their Medicaid eligibility between other mental health agencies um, and not have to be them themselves. Just as a side, sorry. Are there any like web-based kind of training for parents? There are some, you know, I'm not a big advocate of that because I do believe that the support, especially for the high risk population, but for more low risk behavior problems, there are, um, they can access, going on the American Psychological Association's website, there are resources listed for parents. Um, the social emotional learning link that's actually on the ISB, the Illinois State Board of Ed, um, also provides resources that parents can access, and some of them do include internet resources. So. Any other questions? Yes. Just a comment. I found a, a good book uh, called uh, Parent Effectiveness Training, PET. Okay. Um, and, and, uh, and actually our parish, one of the priests, uh, trained in, with uh, the PET and runs courses every year. Excellent. Um, which is great because it's eight weeks and it's also group-based. Uh-huh. So, Wonderful. That's in blend with anybody else. Okay. Training of clinical social workers and therapists and counselors, my impression is they won't see kids like two to five much. It's mainly put on the child psychologist. Would that be a fair estimate? Or there are folks who were trained to handle behavioral issues from three to five. I think there are. I think it may be hard to find, but it does seem to be that PsyDs and social workers are expanding their practice as well because they see that there's a niche, there's a need, and so, um, but also you might find them associated with practices that do early intervention, OT, PT, and will have a social worker affiliated with the practice that will help with behavior problems. May not be sole practitioners, but within a group, more likely to find that kind of help. Well, I hope this was helpful. Thank you, Thank you so much. Hey, please remember to fill out your evaluations. Thank you.